Good morning, my friend. You're here. Oh, great to see you. Good to see you. What is this? This is so cool. This is a newer exhibit that we've been working on. It's of some Ken Weber furniture, uh, an animator's office. from All authentic from that era. Every piece. Including that iPad. No, that's mine. I thought it would be really fun on our tour to look at some historic photos, so I downloaded a few. Cool. Let's go. Lead the way. Got it. I gotta tell you, I know you work here every day, so this is old hat for you, but whenever I walk into Legends Plaza, this is a place I just have to sort of stop and, and yeah. take a breath. This is like the Hall of Fame of Disney. I know you said you have a lot of stuff we need to see, but uh, this building, Team Disney, which is the corporate headquarters of the Walt Disney Company, is such an iconic part of this lot. Explain the meaning of the seven dwarves holding up the roof. Well, you know, the studio was built on the funds that came from the enormous success of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So this is kind of representative of that idea that the, you know, the seven dwarfs are holding up the, uh, the roof of the company. So it's, it's whimsical and a lot of fun and, and very popular. Yeah. Very cool. All right, let's head out. Okay. doke. This is the main entrance to the studio here. It's here now, it wasn't here originally. The original entrance was right over there where that gray building is, which okay. is the Hyperion Health Club. And uh, the original gate sat about probably 20 yards that direction. Uh, but that's where that famous shot with Walt Disney was located, hmm. right there, as you see the, the casting building in the background and the guard shack. And uh, so this is the new entrance. As Fun a, to think about all studios. the people who have driven through this gate. Indeed, a lot of very famous people have come yeah. through this gate, so it's pretty cool. Cool. So, shall we move on? Let's see more. Okay. Am I correct that this was actually one of the buildings um, it's original to the Hyperion lot, right? Yeah. This so building was relocated here? It is, exactly. It's, it's, well, that's why we call it the Hyperion Bungalow, because yeah. they actually picked it up and brought it over the hill to Burbank in 1939 and put it on this lot. It wasn't in that location. It was actually over there where the commissary deck is now. But uh, it is the original, and it's a California bungalow architecture. It's amazing to think about that coming down the freeway. Probably something you couldn't <laughs> do in current Burbank traffic. No, probably not. And I would love to have seen that, but unfortunately not. But you know, this isn't the only building that was brought over here from the Hyperion really? Studio. There were several buildings. Uh, there were some boxcars, which uh, were where the original model shop was, that actually were situated right here where we are. So this grassy area held these two long, they looked like freight train boxcars, and that's where the model department was originally. That's amazing. And yeah, they, they demolished them quite a long time ago, and so this area now is a kind of a grassy uh, area for the employees, and the employee center, of course, is right over here next right. to it. We can see some of the other relocated buildings today, yeah, too? Yeah, I'll point them out to you as we go through okay. the, the studio. Awesome. So when they redid the theater recently, they redid all the lighting in here, and I think this is just beautiful now. Isn't yeah. that pretty? And it changes colors. It goes from blue to red, and really, really lovely. So all the advanced screenings will happen in here, and yeah, we do publicity screenings, we do advanced screenings, we do screenings for employees. We also do events in here sometimes. We've had 
panels and discussions beforehand. We have big meetings in here, so the corporate synergy meeting usually happens in here uh, every few months. And it's used for a lot of different things, and it used to be used a lot for mixing, but they decided they wanted a screening theater again, so they took out all the mixing equipment that was in here previously and kind of turned it back into a deluxe theater. Yeah, quite a facility. Yeah, it's the biggest one here on the lot. It's a little different from my local Cineplex. <laughs> Just a little bit, and the seats are very comfy, I have to say. It's nice. <laughs> so speaking of lovely colors, uh, they redid the lobby as well and added this in and it, this was a really fun project to work on. They, it they looks came, familiar. It does, it should. It's uh, from the Nutcracker Suite section of Fantasia and we did that in honor of the fact that one of the first films that opened in here, Pinocchio, was almost completed when the studio opened and so it premiered in here but it wasn't actually animated here on the lot but a great deal of Fantasia was and so we chose uh, images from Fantasia and, uh, to put into the, the theater to pay homage to that film. It's pretty. Isn't that beautiful? I noticed similar etchings out in the Yeah, as we lobby. go through the lobby, I can, show, I can point those out yeah, to you too. Yeah, let's check it out. So this is the lobby of the theater. And as you can see, more Fantasia artwork. I just love that on the glass. So. Isn't that great? And another fun historic thing in this uh, facility is something that even the employees here at the studio don't really remember or catch. But this plaque right here is dedicated to Earl O. Hurd, who they say is our artist, inventor, and pioneer. He was the creator of cell animation. He and his partner, Paul Bray, actually invented the idea of putting celluloids and filming them with paint on them to make characters. And so he uh, died in 1940, which was the year the studio opened. And in honor of him, he was working here on Fantasia with Walt. And in his honor, the studio employees here gathered up a fund and created that plaque and put it there for him. That's cool. So when they uh, re redid this theater and redecorated everything, somebody was going to take that down. And I said, absolutely not. You're going to leave it there, and you're going to put a light on it. So now people, as they come in and out, know that this, this theater is dedicated to Mr. Hurd. Ever the protector of history. Absolutely. Good work, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>a really fun corner. This is the Shorts building, which is another one of those buildings that was brought over from the Hyperion studio. This is a two-story building, which is pretty insane. Again, think about moving this building coming down the freeways. Exactly. Crazy. We've got some photos I'll show you of that. It was pretty wild them putting it in here. But the Shorts building is actually where they filmed, you know, Donald Duck was created in that building and this is where all the early shorts were done. They were the animation building when they were over at the Hyperion studio brought them over here and then they used them to do all the shorts. So the animated films would be done in the animation building behind us, but the shorts building is where they would film all the shorts. So this is a great shot of the, uh, cam the cutting building and the water tower in the background, which is the other iconic uh, thing here on the lot that everybody takes pictures of. It's kind of fun though, you can see the vaults behind it. Those are the old vaults. When you look down the street here, you can see the brand new film vault mm -hmm. that just opened uh, just recently, like a couple months ago they dedicated it but this is the old one. So all you really see are the different architecture mm -hmm. in these buildings there. Other than that, it's pretty similar. Yeah, it's very similar. The, the cutting building is the same, and then there's the new building on the corner. But those film vaults are really interesting. They were thinner on the top and thicker on the bottom. The walls at the bottom were very, very thick, and the top, the roof up here, was very thin so that the nitrate film that was stored in there, if it happened to explode, which it did, and it's nitroglycerin based, it's very volatile. If it got too hot and exploded and some catastrophe happened, that all the force would go up through the roof and wouldn't blow out on the sides. And that way they could, you know, prevent injury to people if, if possible. Sounds horrifying. But that's the way all the studio film vaults were up until recently, and, and they recently took those out just a, about a year ago. inside sound stage two which is the largest stage on the lot and uh, this has got uh, some pretty historic significance to the Walt Disney Company this is not only the biggest stage that we have uh, it's about 32,000 square feet but it is also where Cherry Tree Lane was uh, 
filmed. Yeah, it was all built. <laughs> You're right where Crazy. it happened. Yes, this is it. And uh, also, we've, we've done Pirates of the Caribbean was done in here. Uh, Armageddon. Uh, there's a there's a big crater under our floor here that they dug out uh, to make it the crater of, of the asteroid in Armageddon, and then they used it in Pirates of the Caribbean. They filled it full of water, and that was the Isla de la Muerta caves where the treasure was, yep. and also the Blue Bayou from the second Pirates film. So this is a, a among a lot of other things, including Princess Diaries, things like that. The connection is so important to Julie Andrews for uh, both Mary Poppins and Princess Diaries, which were both filmed in here, that they actually named this the Julie Andrews stage. That's cool. So it's dedicated to her. Well, we've got a lot of stuff to look at, so let's keep going. All right. So right about here is this shot right there. And you can see there are a lot of trees there now that yeah. weren't there in 1940. But the uh, you can't even see the, the Griffith Park Hills, which are in the background there. They're covered over with the vegetation right now. But um, this is Minnie Avenue. And the interesting thing about this is that you can really see the process of animation here by looking at just these buildings. So these are the oldest buildings and the most important buildings on the lot. So they're really laid out in sequential order of the animation process, right? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, not only are they laid out in sequence as the buildings, but the buildings themselves are in sequence. So if in the animation process, you would stop, start on the third floor of this animation building. So you can see right there on the corner is Walt Disney's office. And it would go from Walt Disney and the producers and directors and everybody who had offices on the third floor. And then it would wind its way down to the third, down through the second floor where the art layout artists and composers had offices through there. But then it would end up on the first floor, which is where all the animation was done. So the animators would then draw the drawings and then they would go over to this building which is the inking and painting building over on this side of the street and then they would go from the ink and paint building to the camera building where the uh, painted cells were shot and then they would go from the camera building to the cutting building where the editing was done and then of course you would have the other buildings nearby like the sound stages at stage A where the orchestra recording was done, B and C where the dialogue and, and special effects and sound effects recordings were done. And so all of these support buildings would support the, the important functions of these animation buildings. Now, is it true that there are actually tunnels beneath us that connect these buildings so animators could move art from one building to the next without going outside? Yeah, it really is true because here in Southern California, we usually have glorious weather like this, but often it gets windy and raining. Sometimes it does rain in Southern California. So they actually, when they built these buildings, they put a tunnel that went from the basement of the animation building over to the basement of the ink and paint and the, and the uh, camera building. And so the, the guys would push trolleys of, tra of cells and animation artwork. They would push it over to where the cells were inked and painted. I don't suppose we could see the tunnel. If you're very nice to me. I'm always nice to you. No, that's true. Okay, let's do that. Cool. Okay. We're going to go in here and see the tunnels. Awesome. I think there's some place I want to stop and take you in first and introduce you to some people that are really great. All right. you to somebody very special here at Ink and Paint. This is Antonio Palayo. My pleasure, Ryan. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Antonio is an inker and a painter and the head of special effects here at uh, Ink and Paint and Feature Animation. Very cool. What are you working on today? I'm uh, working on a Mickey Mouse cell. I'll take you guys through the process. Great. So I'm, I'm wearing these gloves because we don't want to ruin the cell. Uh, we use the gloves to uh, help us glide our hand on the cell and uh, we don't want any fingerprints as well. Um, so what we do here is um, we do two editions a year which are sold only to employees and what we use is a cleaned up version of the animator's pencil drawing and our job is to transfer those lines onto the cell. So we have a cell there, these are the tools that I use and then what I do is I pick out a section to start off with. I use this stick to help me um, hold down the cell because it tends to bubble up and I also use that stick to get, um, help me get the ink flowing from the nib. So what I do is I push the ink to the tip, 
Once I do that, then I, I start inking. Gosh, boy, that takes a delicate hand. I hate to take you away from your work, but would you mind showing us around? This is such a historic building. I'd love to see the place. Not at all. Great. So we are, here we have the painting process. Um, basically what happens is once we do all the line work on top of the cell, we flip the cell, it goes to the painter, in this case Sherry Vandoli, and uh, we paint the cell on the back. What's it like to work in this space? I know this is where you come to work every day, but for me, when I step in here, it's amazing. Do you get a, still get a sense of that history and the legacy you're carrying on in this building? Absolutely. I mean, this <clears throat> they painted some feature films here well, since 1940. So it's, it's kind of special, yeah. I feel privileged and honored. Yeah, everything from Pinocchio and Fantasia to Little Mermaid mm -hmm. down in here. Walt Disney Walk, these halls. He hung out in here quite often, oh, yeah. actually. Oh, yeah. It's a privilege to be here. Now these aren't exactly off-the-shelf paints. You guys are actually developing the paints here, correct? Absolutely. Can we learn more about where the paints come from? Yes, uh, let me introduce you to Jim Lesby. Great. This is Jim Lesby. Ryan. He will explain the paint process and um, I'm going to go set up uh, special effects. Great, thank you. Great. Well, welcome to the paint lab. Uh, back in the day, we used a gum-based resin paint. Uh, it took the artists uh, a long time to do the features, maybe four and five years. Um, the paint dried so slowly. Uh, each cell took about eight hours to dry. Uh, in 1986, <laughs> with Oliver and company, the thought was, let's make a fast-drying acrylic paint because we have a lot more stories to tell. We want to get the features released so much quicker. So that's what we've done ever since. I have all my base formulas up here. Uh, we have anything in our paint lab here from Ariel from Little Mermaid. We have Roy uh, after uh, Roy Disney. <laughs> Um, but we can make any color in this lab. Uh, there's 4,000 colors right wow. now. And um, I have my master chip for every color that uh, I have in cases over there. And I do all the matching by eye. You must have an amazing eye. <laughs> well, I call in another group uh, cast member to come in and help us out on that when there's a color that I think is not exactly correct. But when we get a couple of different eyes in here, since everybody sees color a little differently, uh, then we agree that that's close enough. And we write CE on the cell, it's, it's close enough. <laughs> so it is as much art as science. Exactly. Jim, thank you, sir. Right, really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you for coming We're going to go catch up with Antonio. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Well, looky here. Antonio, we are back. So what we're going to do here is we're going to show you guys how we do Tinkerbell's wings. Hmm. And in this case, the wings go on the back of the cell. Um, we're using these uh, mask frisket. We put it on top. We have the paint inside this little cup here. And then we start spraying. And this process was used back in production days as well. So this was actually done in Peter Pan and all the TV shows Absolutely. and everything with Tinkerbell in it? Yes. That's why I used to take five, six years to produce a film. You could imagine. Oh my gosh. At how many frames per second? 24. 24. <laughs> a lot. And just for the special effects, um, we end up with a bunch of these masks because, uh, because of all the pieces. But as you can see, look at that. Just That's a little sample. Great. Look at that. Well, thank you so much for letting us into your space. This has been such a pleasure. Thank great you. to meet you. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you. you thank you. It's always a pleasure. Well, I did promise because you were such a good boy that you could see the tunnels under the ink and paint department. And this is them. This is the uh, entrance from oh, the this is so cool. ink and paint side. So, what these were for was to bring animation uh, from the animator's building, the animation building, over to the ink and paint building without having it exposed to the elements, so they would use this underground tunnel. It's a steep incline. <laughs> it's very steep. In fact, Roy Disney once told me a story about when he was a kid. They uh, had lots of cells left over after the filming was done, and they would store them down here. 
So Roy said that the animators for fun would grab these cells and they'd throw them down on the floor in these tunnels and they would slide on them and see how far they could go before they fell down. This is, by today's standards, priceless artwork exactly. being used as toboggans. And you know what's really funny is that they actually used to grab Roy and they would stand him on him and two animators would grab each hand and slide him down the hall as far as they could go. Um, I don't think anybody ever explained to his dad what they were doing. <laughs> and as far as I know, he never cracked his head open, so I guess everything was okay. So as you know, this, uh, these buildings have been used many times in our own movies as locations yeah. for many films, most recently for Saving Mr. Banks. Love that film. So uh, fans of that film will recognize some of these locations, including my favorite one, which is right over there next to that tree. Yeah. The really touching scene with Emma Thompson is where she's sitting there, you know, playing with the little leaves and, and sticks. Building and, things out of twigs. Yeah, and I was really lucky. I got to come over and watch this, and it was really, really cool, because they set up the cameras right over there, and I got to stand right there and watch Emma Thompson. It was really cool. Ryan. 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 Come on, we're burning Sorry. daylight. <laughs> Actors. My hands a little dirty. <laughs> yeah. yeah, wash your hands. We're going to Walt's office. Ryan and Becky enter the lot's historic animation building, where Walt Disney's personal offices occupied Suite 3H from 1940 to 1966. Following Walt's passing, the offices were meticulously photographed and inventoried, down to the last paperclip, by Disney legend and Walt Disney Archives founder Dave Smith. While numerous executives and producers occupied and altered the space in the decades since, Becky and her team have now painstakingly restored the suite to its original form. The furnishings, accessories, and artifacts you're about to see are original, appearing exactly as they did when Walt passed away in December 1966. Welcome to the beating heart of the Walt Disney Studios. Welcome to Suite 3H. So come on in, Ryan. So this is the reception area of the offices. It still uh, hasn't been restored completely, but it's reminiscent of what it used to be when this was Tommy Wilkes office and Dolores Vaught was in here. Uh, there's a few things in here. Those are some Walt's Real Awards in the cabinet. We had that made. And then this is set up here just to kind of give you the impression that it's a secretary's office. This is an original Kim Weber desk, a little smaller than the one she actually used. And then it's propped out with some real pieces and a few pieces from Saving Mr. Banks that we brought up here. Uh, but this isn't what you came to see. I'm gonna show you the real deal. So here's what you've been waiting for. I think I'm ready. You ready? I think so. Okay. So here we are. You've gotta be kidding me. Pretty cool, huh? I think I need a moment. It's unbelievable. Thank you. This is just, you know, I always say that there are times in your career where you stop and you think, how did I get here? And as the kid who grew up, you know, worshiping the guy who sat at that desk and to be standing here, it's, it's unbelievable. I get that way every time I come in here, and I come in a lot. <laughs> wow, it's crazy. It's different seeing it behind glass, huh? <laughs> and seeing it in photos and on film, but there's just something about being in this room that's, yeah, it's hard to describe. To think how that piano changed pop culture history is... Exactly. In fact, one of the most interesting things is that when I brought Richard Sherman here the first time, he came in and had the same the reaction. He kind of stepped back and said, oh my gosh, you know, this is like walking back in time. I can imagine. 
And what was really wonderful is that he walked immediately over to the piano and the first thing he saw was the Annette Funicello uh, music there, it was the Strumman song. And he says, that's the first song I ever played on this piano. And he sat down and started playing it. And that is the piano that Richard sat down and played, Feed the Birds. And you know, he tells the story of how Walt would stand and look out the window while he played Feed the Birds on Friday evenings yeah. or late in the day. And Richard said, that's it. He would sit down right there, play the piano, and Walt would look out the, uh, the northern And Walt window. didn't even have to ask for the song. He could just say, play it. Just say, and play Richard it. Richard knew exactly what he meant. So let's come over and look at the desk. This is um, obviously the most important piece in the room, um, Walt Disney's desk. And the items that are on it were, you know, originally there. I think one of the things that's really interesting to me about Walt Disney's offices in general and specifically this little corner is that you really get a feeling of how much he adored his daughters. You just, you can see his miniatures and you see everything, but, but I mean, look at this. There's, there's all these photographs, the baby shoes. Yeah. You know, those are Diane and Sharon's baby shoes there on display and his baby picture of Diane there and, you know, the Norman Rockwell pictures of uh, Diane and Sharon that were done for, for Walt. And you, know, you can just see throughout the whole office you know, how much his girls meant to him. You know, there's photos, of course, over on the piano as well, and there's other photos in the working office. Even the fact that someone like Norman Rockwell would draw pictures of your kids speaks to who Walt yeah. Disney was. <laughs> and the miniatures was another miniatures. fascination of his. He did. He collected miniatures. He made miniatures. He collected them. Um, he had a miniatures room in the other part of the suite. He had a room where he kept cabinets of miniatures, but he also had these. A lot of them he collected, but a good percentage of them people found out that he collected miniatures, and so they would send him gifts. People would bring him a miniature, or they would send them to him um, for you know gifts. Most of them have nothing to do with Disney uh, characters. You can see there's some glass, Pluto and Mickey there, and Donald Duck and Tinkerbell and so forth. But most of them are not, you know, they're not Disney miniatures. So there's a couple other really interesting pieces here on the desk. This uh, piece right here is uh, an award that was given to Walt. It was a thank you gift from the, the uh, U.S. Coast Guard. Walt had worked on a film called Men Against the Arctic, which was a People and Places film in the 50s, and they gave him this bell as a, as a thank you gift for doing it, and so he was very proud of that, and he kept it here on his desk. And there's a funny story. Tommy Wilk, who was his secretary at the time, sat in the outer office there, and she said in an interview that Walt would often have meetings in this room, and it would get very you know intense, and they would get focused, and they would be working away. And one of her main jobs was to make sure that Walt broke, you know, would take a break for lunch because otherwise he wouldn't get anything to eat and, you know, we didn't want Walt, you know, grumpy in the afternoon. And so she would come in here and interrupt him when it came time for lunch because he had to take his lunch. And she said that one time she came in here and there was this big meeting going on and she kept trying to get Walt's attention and he wouldn't listen and he kept ignoring her. And finally she walked over to the bell and she grabbed it and she rang it as loud as she could and everything stopped dead. And she said, it's time for lunch. <laughs> and fortunately, Walt thought that was funny and started laughing. And so he, he got so tickled by it that he, he told her that I want you to come in and ring that bell for lunch every <laughs> single day. And so every day after that, she would come in and ring the bell when it was lunchtime. Funny. So that's the bell. So we didn't have that in our collection. That had gone back to the Walt Disney family after Walt's passing. And so uh, the folks at the family museum were, were really gracious about loaning it to us nice. to, to display on the desk because it was such an important piece yeah. in this office. So we really appreciated that, that they loaned it to us. Uh, the other piece that everyone asks about, of course, is this Gulfstream jet model. This is the Gulfstream, the Grumman Gulfstream II jet. And this particular jet was on order. Walt had this jet um, on order and it was going to be delivered. And sadly, you know, when he passed away, uh, Roy decided they didn't need another jet. And so he canceled the order. But Walt was expecting that plane to come. So this would have been the follow up to the, the Mickey one Mickey that one, Mickey was out on display at uh, mm -hmm. Disney's Hollywood Studios for many years. Exactly. Like yeah. And so we had actually we had four planes over the years. There was a King Air and a Queen Air Beechcraft. And then there was the Gulf, Gulfstream one, which is Mickey Mouse one and then this would have been the fourth plane. Mm -hmm. So Walt was anxiously anticipating its delivery and then it didn't happen. So we never did get that one, but he had it very proudly on his desk. I mean, huge credit to the company and to Dave, and then obviously credit to you and your team for pulling this all back together, but yeah. and this stuff could so have easily been just oh, created yeah. up and lost Absolutely. to history. Absolutely, and, and he, they, they very cleverly you know, brought in a photographer and photographed every angle of the room so we knew exactly the way it looked when Walt passed. So we could very, you know, easily pull the books out and put them exactly where they belonged and the scripts are back where they were because we could see in the pictures. And uh, every single 
part of the room was photographed, and, that, and Dave did that. That was yeah. That was pretty special. And obviously handled with a tremendous amount of care. These are some pretty delicate. Oh yeah, items that yeah. There are, are some, in remarkable condition. Yeah, took good care of them. They were on display down at Disneyland for a while, and um, then we showed them briefly in a couple traveling exhibits at the Reagan Library and at MSI. But other than that, they've, they've been carefully tucked away for a while. One of the things I wanted to, to point out to you in here too that's pretty special is you see the little mechanical bird here. I don't know what um, this is. Yes. That one is broken. One of the grand, uh, grandchildren uh, knocked that off and broke it one time. I think Victoria knocked that off the counter. Um, but that one doesn't work. But the one that does work is hanging up in the corner there. And that's the little uh, bird that uh, inspired Walt to make audio animatronics. So Purchased in New Orleans, I believe? He bought one in New Orleans, and we think he bought one in Paris. We're not sure which is which. He always just said he bought a little bird. And we don't know which was the first one or which one he bought in which place, but it was one of these two birds that was the inspiration for audio animatronics. People ask me all the time about the books, and I think this is a fascinating thing. These are the original book cases. Uh, we put them back in, and all of the books that are here were just as Walt left them. Really? So if they're leaning, it's because Walt left them leaning. Wow. And if they're upside down, it's because Walt left them that way. They're exactly the way he had them up here. And I find them fascinating because a lot of them are signed to Walt, they're inscribed. Um, but just the choices of you know what he had on his bookshelf, it's really fascinating to kind of look at it and say, okay, you know, I understand maybe the Kodiak bear, that makes sense. Right. He wrote, made movies about bears. You know, and then you look over at something else that doesn't seem to make so much sense, like, you know, why are there Croatian tales or or you know, I'm trying to think of some of the, the, the very strange ones in here. There's a couple. Um, you know, Maury Fontaine, Scientist of the Sea, and uh, you know the birds of North America, or birds of the birds of the gauntlets. That would be about falconry. Um, some of these books are, are really cool. Um, here, this is a fun one. I'll bring this out, and you can see it up close. This is Undercover Cat. This is the book that um, the that darn cat was based on, <laughs> written by the Gordons. And if you look inside, you can see that it was inscribed to Walt to Walt here. And it was to Walt from one smart cat to another, and it's and his humans, Millie and the Gordons. Mm -hmm. In 1963. I think the variety really speaks to his curiosity. Oh, right? So you see literature and history and politics and uh, nature, and it yeah. really runs the gamut. And some things were just, I, were obviously, I think, probably gifts from visitors who brought books. Um, some of them were people that he knew. You know, there's things about Richard Nixon here. He was friends with Richard Nixon. Salvador Dali. You know, the dynamic laws of healing. What was that about, <laughs> you know? Um, Salvador Dali, exactly. Um, and so there's there's fun, you know, really interesting that you read Kipling. So things that he based his, his stories on and his, his movies. So it's kind of cool. And so this is, this is just a fascinating glimpse at what was you know, in Walt's head and what kind of things he had around him. Um, so it's kind of neat. And then over here, I get asked about this quite often. I think this is really cool. This is a Fiat. Does that look familiar to you? It sure does. Looks like <laughs> Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Exactly. So I don't know if he bought this when they were talking about doing Mr. Toad's or whether yeah. that was the inspiration for what ultimately became Mr. Toad's car. But one way or the other, it's an interesting little uh, little piece. Who knew Thaddeus drove a Fiat? Exactly. <laughs> he was British. He didn't know <laughs> he'd be driving an Italian car. Uh, so fun, really fun stuff. And uh, this cabinet is really fascinating. Um, you open it up here. Oh my gosh. And this was a script cabinet that he had built specifically for the scripts that he was working on at the time. So you can see there's labels. There's a new Merlin Jones. So I think this probably a, a sequel that they were looking at maybe doing. Um, family is a menagerie, that would be my family is a menagerie. Uh, nothing, boy called nothing. So a lot of these were TV scripts, some of them were features. You know, Willie and the Yank, that one got made. So it'll be kind of fun. John Lasseter was in here and he said, like, I want to look through every one of those scripts and I want to look at every one of those books and see what Walt was thinking. And I said, okay, you can come anytime you want. <laughs>
So now the next place that I want to take you in, this was the formal office, and this is where he did all of, like I said, his big meetings and his formal occasions and formal VIP visits, but where he spent most of his time and what to me is the Holy of Holies is through this door. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing you walk into a room like this and you think about uh, the decisions made in this room and how they changed our lives and everyone's lives watching this. And mm -hmm. This is the room where they developed Disneyland. This is where audio animatronics were first conceived. This is where he came up with you know, it's a small world and yeah, <laughs> everything, everything was from right here. And everything from 1940 to 1966 was conceived in this room. So Disneyland, it, Project Florida, Mineral King, you know, his projects that didn't happen like the St. Louis Project and things like that um, all were conceived in here. But also, you know, the movies, this is where he worked when they were making Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella and this was his office during World War II. So all of the World War II stuff happened in here. This is where he came up with television. This is where they discussed it and they would sit at this table and you know there were times the secretary said there were times when this was wall-to-wall -wall people that there would be people on every every chair every couch but there would be people on the floor but it it just it was the beating heart of the Walt Disney Studios. Yeah. This is it. This is where he created. And I, I think that this has a really special aura and vibe about it. I, I come in here sometimes when it's completely quiet and I just, I feel like he just walked out of the room and sometimes I feel like I'm intruding, like, oh, oh dear, you know, Walt's gonna come back and catch me. It does have that sense, like I kind of feel like I'm not supposed to be here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you feel like you're intruding yeah. on something and, and like, you know, he's gonna, you know, come down the hall and cough any second and walk in on us. And I get that feeling often, especially when I'm here by myself. And, and it's just, it's, it's a wonderful, warm, cozy place to be. It's, it's, a, it's you know, intimate. And it doesn't look like, like the office of a movie mogul. You know, right. Louis B. Mayer's office had a gigantic desk with a big spotlight on it, and it was very intimidating. And there's nothing intimidating about this office. Right. It's, it's strikingly approachable. And he didn't even have a big desk in here. That's more of a table. It's more of a conference. Yeah. This was originally going to be a conference room. And Walt decided he wanted a more private office. And so he set it up so that they could get down to the nitty gritty in here. And they would sit around Walt's table here. And and uh, Marty, Marty Sklar told me that they would, you know, move everything off of the table and they'd lay out whatever plans they were working on. So if they had a drawing of of a new attraction or they had you know scripts to go over or they were talking storyboarding and things they would bring in the drawings and they would lay them out on Walt's desk and discuss everything and so that's what this area was and then of course he was surrounded by just things he liked little little things you can see all the little pieces over there on top of the script cabinet and um, things that he liked to have around him you know there's the the, the Mickey Mouse one you know, mm -hmm. the the plane that that uh, Walt flew over uh, when he was doing the Project Florida uh, research and flying over Florida and also that's the plane that they took to you know the New York World's Fair yeah. in 1964-65. That plane made lots and lots of trips and a lot of people have seen it on the Backlot Tour. But uh, it's a, a lovely little model and he, he was so proud of that. He loved his planes and then over on the other side there you can see the, the King Air. It was the predecessor to that one. Explain the the sculpture that's on the windowsill. Oh, I think, I believe that's a Yadro sculpture, and that's the Little Mermaid. And yeah. there's actually several uh, Little Mermaid statues in the office. There's one so over on up, the piano. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and that, I don't know if it was a gift to him. I think one of them was a gift from, from Copenhagen. I don't know if he just collected them, but, but the Little Mermaid was something that he was very interested in Tivoli Gardens and, and had been to Denmark and um, liked the Little Mermaid. And, you know, of course, they, that he had worked on a, a version of Little Mermaid with Kai Nielsen and, and they had yeah. intended to do a version of it earlier back in the 30s and that never happened but then of course we did it later with Ashman and Mencken. Yeah good idea never dies at Disney just exactly just waits for its it waits life. for its its time yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah so there's a lot of really interesting little tidbits around here of course you know little little pieces from Alice in Wonderland and Anna Minoros another lady you know this yeah. another one there 
but he loved the plane. You can see he had the pictures of the plane, and then he had pictures of the interior of the plane up here on the bulletin board. The bulletin board is kind of interesting. Um, this aerial was probably, um, the closest I can guess on this was probably about 1965. Six, maybe early 66, but I think 65. Okay. Um, what he did is, is he would change this out. He would change the aerial out and, and use it during his meetings, and they would point out where they wanted to put things, and, and it's all color-coded, so the red things are recent, uh, things that were recently worked on or put in, and then the yellows were coming attractions. Well, you know, Small World was in before Walt passed away. Yeah and New Orleans Square did open. Pirates of the Caribbean hadn't opened yet, but they, but, so this is a little, the, it was a little out of date even when Walt passed away. He was probably gonna put up a new one soon. And the Haunted Mansion opened, but Haunted with a Mansion. diminished capacity. Right, but it didn't open until, yeah. Future home of a thousand and one ghosts. Yeah. They knocked it down to, <laughs> to 999 by the time it opened. Well, there's always room for one more, <laughs> right. so. Um, this I find interesting. This is a brochure for uh, what eventually became Cal Arts, mm -hmm. and that's actually, but the brochure has it li being located at the Golden Oak Ranch. And it ultimately got uh, built over in Valencia, which is several miles away. And for people who don't know, the Golden Oak Ranch is still a working studio ranch. One yeah. of the last really remaining in Yeah, in it's one of, one of the few. I mean, and we do film up there still. We just put a new, uh, put some new residential areas and we built a new business uh, area. And yeah, we use it all the time. And people, people don't know it, but they've seen commercials and TV shows and everything filmed up there. And yeah, there aren't very many movie ranches left. It's kind of where the Golden place. Oak development at Walt Disney World got its name. Exactly, and you know the Golden Oak is where gold was first discovered in California. So right there in that spot. And it wasn't, it wasn't actually discovered at Sutter's Mill, it was discovered first at the Golden Oak Ranch. I didn't know that. Yeah. So let's uh, take a closer look at the desk over here. Because there's some really interesting stuff over here. So this is exactly what was on the desk when Walt passed away and Dave came in and inventoried everything in here, like he said, down to the last paper clips. And those are the paper clips. You know, his little red grease pencil and, you know, letter opener and, and things like that, uh, magnifying glass. This was his Rolodex. <laughs> and it says right there, Sherman boys. So he really did call them the boys. Wow. <laughs> All the time. So Harry Tidal, Don Tatum, um, Marty Sklar. And so he would, this would change, he would close it, and then uh, you know, he would open it up to D. So there's Mark Davis, Mark Davis. Don DeGrotti, Roy Disney. It's amazing seeing the personal extension phone numbers of so many people whose hands are now in bronze here exactly. on the Exactly, <laughs> in Legends Plaza. Crazy. It's pretty true. It would be interesting to match them up and see how many of them were actually in there. Tag the plaques with their phone numbers. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> yes, see a production budget? Yeah, this is a production budget for Blackbeard's Ghost which was in production at the time Walt passed on. And then uh, down here is his briefcase. Apparently did some international traveling recently. There's still the residue of a U.S. <laughs> customs. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing too, I have a Dave Smith story to tell you about this. Um, it used to be that telephones belonged to the telephone company. They didn't belong to you. I didn't know that. Or, yeah, you, you didn't buy a phone. That You, you just kind of rented one from yeah. the phone company. And if you moved and left, you gave it back. Well, this is Walt Disney's telephone. This is Walt's phone. So when they started taking everything out of these offices, the uh, telephone company was going to come and pick up the phones, and Dave cut the cord and hid them. <laughs> Again, credit to Dave. So these are the real deal. So this is that's the phone that Walt talked to people on. Wow. And uh, the same with the one in the formal office. So Dave snipped them and hid them. Hmm. So they couldn't find them when the phone company came to pick them That's up. That's funny. There's one other very special thing in this uh, in this office that I want to share with you, and this is also something that people that saw this office on display down at Disneyland never actually saw. So this is pretty special. Back here behind this light, there is a little push button, and when you push it, wow, it's like Tomorrowland. <laughs> it is indeed. That's Walt's kitchen. And if I go through here, and for me, this is the, one of the most fun things about this office. Of course, you know, you've got Walt's stove here, an electric stove. But what's really cool are these cupboards because they were built by General Electric. Hmm. And so if you look in here, you can see the GE logo and they light up when you open it. Like they, the they've the always future. done it. Exactly. 
Exactly, and so not all of them light up, but this one does, and this one. You can have Spam, or Chili, or Frozen Vegetables, or Jello. Pretty much it. <laughs> you know what's cool? I thought we were talking out there about how the office isn't pretentious and it's not showy and it's warm. And once again, that supports that, right? Just mm -hmm, absolutely. Even Walt Disney, at his stature, regular guy. Oh, he had very plain tastes. He liked stew and chili and red jello and that kind of thing. He really did. And these are the kind of things that were kept in here because if he didn't get lunch, like I said, sometimes he was so busy, he didn't, wasn't able to. And so he'd come in here himself and make himself a pot of chili on the stove. To say thank you seems like too little. I mean, obviously you're the very first person I ever met in this company and you've opened a lot of doors in my career, but opening these doors and letting <laughs> me in this space is something that you saw my reaction. I didn't expect to have that level of reaction, but this has just been one of those unbelievable days. So I feel like we should sit and uh, have a bowl of chili in Walt's honor. Oh, well, there you go. Well, I could make some in here, but I think it probably would be better if we went over to the commissary and had a bowl, because they still serve Walt's Do they really? every day. Tell you what, it's on me. Okay, right, you got go. a deal. All right. Well, my friend, here's to a great day on the lot. And to Walt. Thank you.